9.1. Jesus heals a man born blind. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. I think that's the main verse right there. We must work the words of him who sent me while in its day night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Good to have you all here this morning. And trust, uh, as uh, Brian said, that you've had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving with family. And uh, my wife and I were down in Maryland, had a wonderful time with family, and uh, glad to have come back, but we didn't come back with all the snow that you guys got. I just want you to know, it was cold, but bright and sunny down there where we were <laughs> when you were getting all this snow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for your good and your mercies endure forever. Lord, we thank you that you love us and that you have provided for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the time that we got together with family and just had that time of thanksgiving, that time of uh, remembering things of the past, uh, times of being with those whom we love that we're not uh, with as much as we would love to be. But, uh, Lord, it, it was all good, and I'm glad that we have all arrived back safely and, uh, and that we were blessed in the time that we have spent. Lord, we are so uh, thankful because of who you are and all that you have accomplished on our behalf and are accomplishing. Uh, in, our, in our passage today, it says uh, that you are working the works of God that might be displayed, not only in Christ, but also in us. Lord, we are thankful for that. And also, Lord, we are thankful that you are answering uh, the needs and the prayers uh, that we have been sending out for others. I want to just bring up Larry Thurber before you. He is doing so well in his recovery. And uh, we thank you for that um, in areas where he needs to uh, exert a little bit more effort in his uh, physical therapy. Uh, Lord, help him to have the, uh, the fortitude to be able to do that. And also, Father, for Penny and Charlie, Dwayne and Sally, I understand uh, today that uh, they're under the weather. Uh, they have uh, some colds. It sounds like there's a lot of colds that are going around. And we just pray that uh, they would return to health quickly. We pray, Father, for Ken Hicks and his recovery. Uh, we pray for Bill Plester Sr. We pray for Bill Plester and the whole family as they uh, continue to care and love their dad through uh, all that he has been going through. We want to praise you that Lyle is doing better. We want to continue to lift up uh, Ron and Ron Terrell before you and the, the needs, the health needs that are there. Father, we want to commit this service into your care. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, Brian and, and Stacy are coming up for the, for the choir, for the forces. Uh, I just want to read a couple things that Larry sent me, Larry Thurber. He says, please tell uh, everyone that uh, he hopes your Thanksgiving went well. And it sounds like it did. And then he says his uh, physical therapy, his physical therapist wants him to work harder. So pray that he works harder <laughs> in his physical therapy. And uh, thank, he, wants to, he wants me to thank you for all of your prayers and your cards. And uh, I'm going to quote what uh, Larry said here. He says, a church family is truly a great and valuable thing. And so it is. Right? Good morning. We got some uh, courses for you this morning. Inside the bulletin, there is a uh, handout for you, no screen today. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, fan favorites, I call them, and we're going to learn a new one today. So, bear with us. <laughs> he has 
made me glad to the first one. And we'll sing this through twice. <clears throat>
stand for our last song, please. Ten reasons. Make sure to sing this one out. talked about Thanksgiving meal and being thankful. How was your Thanksgiving? Good. Good. Yeah? You had a great time? Lots of good food? Good. Well, in our story today, what I want to talk to you about is this man. In this man, he was born blind. You know what that means to be born blind? Go ahead. Can't see. And if you can't see, and if you're born blind, can you see? Uh, can you can you imagine what it was like to try to imagine something you've never seen before?
absolutely right, Gideon. You're absolutely right. And just think of what it must be like for anybody that's born blind that's never seen anything. And we'll talk about that more next week. But I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever played pin the tail on the donkey? Oh, you have? Caleb, that you have as well? And uh, what's the what's the um, what's the name of the game? What how do you play pin the tail on the donkey? Try to pin the tail on the back of the donkey. Okay. That's pretty easy if you can see it, right? Yeah. But getting you were gonna say something. How do you What's that? Okay, very good. Very good. So what do they do before you get the tail to fit on the donkey? <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, I'm going to, Carson, can I have you come up here for a second? I'm going to try something here. I'm going to put this on you. Oh, I figured this was going to, this was going to happen. Uh, let me try, Olivia, let me, go ahead and sit down, Carson. Let me have you come up, Olivia. Yeah. Do you have your black tape? <laughs> Come on, bring it on up here. Olivia, did you see anything? Oh my goodness. There we go. Can you breathe? <laughs> This is why I don't play games. Don't get it in her hair there, Lee. Don't go around. Can somebody video on these amateurs? job there, Olivia. <laughs> they are good sports, aren't they? they are. <laughs> okay, for our next hymn, it's 448. 448. We'll talk about blindness and eyes. Got a good thing to go into sport. And 448, I'll have you stand as we sing.
updates. They are on the table in the foyer. Please help yourselves. Um, we're looking for a person or two to help in the sound booth. I think we got a couple of people going. So raise the Lord there, but if you're still interested, let them know, okay? Um, please con uh, consider your contribution to our music ministry. Um, if you want to sing or play an instrument or anything like that, please contact the pastor or Dean or Ben. Praise the Lord for your continued giving here uh, at Elgin Baptist Church. And don't forget, um, by the study, Wednesday, December the 1st, 7 p.m. at Worship Place. Is there any other announcements I missed? Okay, ushers, will you come forward for our ties and offerings, please? Matt, would you give a blessing and offering to this? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be in your house. text today in John chapter 9. We'll be looking at just the, uh, the first uh, five verses uh, because there's something connected uh, to this that's uh, very important for us to consider as we look at this passage today. Uh, before I go there, I want to say special thanks to all the ladies who have uh, so beautifully decorated our church with uh, Christmas decorations. They're very tasteful and thank you very much for that to all of you. Good to have Caitlin here with us today and uh, pray for her as she heads back tonight, travels back uh, to Wisconsin, right? So pray for traveling mercies for her as well. The problem that we're going to be looking at as we look at this passage is not just blindness, but the problem of evil. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? A lot of people ask that question, don't they? If God is such a loving God, if God is such a powerful God, then why would he allow such evil? Why does he, if he can do it, why does he just eradicate the evil? Why does he take away suffering? Why do we, why do we have to endure such hardships in life? That's the question. From today's passage, we'll touch upon this topic as we attempt to better understand God's purpose regarding suffering, God's purpose regarding evil, God's purpose regarding the hardships that we go through in life. Let us pray. Father, we look unto you for guidance 
guidance and direction. We thank you that you have revealed what we need to know from your word. And today's passage is right along that line. As we look at this man that was born blind from birth, never having seen anything in life. Lord, is by the touch of your grace, your mercy, and your hand that this man was healed, seeing for the very first time as an adult. Lord, that is how you work in people's lives. We not only have physical eyes, but we have spiritual eyes. And those eyes are blind from birth unless you open them. Father, open our eyes today. Help us to see what you would have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the opening line of today's passage, a question is asked, who sinned? We talk about in the church, uh, as a pastor, we talk about sin a lot in our lives, don't we? And the problem of sin. And the question is asked by Jesus' disciples of Jesus, who sinned? We recognize uh, I, that there is a connection between the presence of evil and corresponding sin. But the answer to evil is not about who sinned. It's about God's providential design for us through the suffering. And the working of his mercy in our lives. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is good? What is God doing, and how is he going to work this through? So, it's never about having sinned. It's never about who sinned. So that's the only point that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, you'll have the outline. You'll have the completed outline there. We'll look at the rest of that next week. But today we're just going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. It's never about who sinned. Look at verse 1 with me. As he, that's speaking of Jesus, as Jesus passed by, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. <clears throat> we don't know how he knows this, but it became evident later on uh, in, the, in the story that we will be looking at next week. But you will notice something here. In this passage, uh, we're introduced to a man that's blind from birth. We don't know his name. We only know his condition. But you notice there that it says, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. The man did not see Jesus, did he? Why did he not see Jesus? He was blind. <laughs> pretty, pretty obvious, right? He couldn't see Jesus. But Jesus saw him. The reality of this man's physical limitation gives us insight into our own spiritual limitation. We were all born spiritually blind. In other words, if it wasn't for God's grace and mercy, we would never have seen Jesus. We would never have gone to the word of God. We would never have sought for him. In fact, the scriptures say that no one will look for Jesus. No one understands. No one seeks God. Romans 3, 11. So God must first do a work in us. He must open our spiritual eyes for us to even be able to see Jesus. We may have physical eyes where we can see the world around us. And, and we have seen so many people that can see everything in the world, but they can't see God. They can't understand Him. In fact, they ask the questions, if, if there is a God, then why, and if God is all powerful, if God is all loving, then why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, as if we are all good people. Now, we can do good things, but we have a sin issue, don't we? So, God
God needs to do a work in all of us, and it's obvious that he has already done a work in you. Hopefully, he has done a work in you, and I trust, I look at out here, and I see a work that God has done in each and every one of your lives. Praise God for that. Pray for our children, that they may have those spiritual eyes to see God in the future, you know, and, and trust Christ as their Savior. And he will continue to do that work in us because he is not finished with the work that he is doing. He is developing his righteousness in us through Christ. But we need to see, have the eyes, the spiritual eyes to see him. So as we get to verse 2, we see that Jesus came upon this man and he knew that he had been born blind. And then it says in verse 2, And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Who sinned, this man or his parents? Well, that's an interesting question to ask. Because who has sinned? All of us. <laughs> Every single person has sinned. The scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. What the disciples were presenting there is something that they had grown up with. A false teaching, an erroneous teaching. There is a teaching that thought that some people can actually sin in the womb, in the mother's womb. They call it prenatal sin. And uh, you see it at evidence here by the disciples asking that question. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he's born blind. And it's interesting here. They use this man. The disciples are using this man as an object lesson to try to learn something here. What's the first thing that, sh that they should have shown toward this man? Compassion. What's the first thing Jesus showed to this man? Compassion. But the disciples come and they, they ask this question. He doesn't condemn them for the question. But it's interesting because where does this thinking come from? That, that a person, we know that when we were born, we were born with a fallen nature. But a child that has just been born has not had the opportunity to sin yet. That child will sin because we all have the propensity to sin because we have the fallen nature. We are going to sin. But this man was not born blind because of something that he had done in his mother's womb. And you see that. Look at verse 34 with me. You see that even with the religious leaders here, they're asking the question when it says, they answered him. That's talking about the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They answered him, you were born in utter sin. No, they were born with a sin nature. They weren't born in utter sin. It goes back to this false teaching that they have given. That sin originated in the room. This, erone this erroneous view was based on Genesis chapter 4. Remember Cain and Abel? It comes, I really don't get it. But this is where they say it comes from. Genesis 4, 6 through 7. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Cain is uh, a young man at this point. And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And so there is a, uh, a theology, a belief system that developed out of that, that Cain in the womb did not sin, or I'm sorry, but Abel in the womb did not sin, but Cain in the womb had sin. So this is where that's coming from. It's an erroneous and false teaching. But that's exactly why the disciples asked that question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So the disciples make that statement about the man being born, born blind, but they're not showing any compassion toward him. 
there's a principle here for us. In what ways are we helping to alleviate the suffering of others? When we see somebody suffer, if it's within our power, within our ability to do so, don't we want to, to do something to help them in their time of need? And that really is what comes out from this passage. This need to be able to have that compassion to help in their time of need. Unless we first put ourselves in the shoes of others, we will never fully understand what they're going through. And I am glad to say that our church family is very good. When we have a need in this family, when somebody has a need in our church family, you all are very good in helping in some way. Praise God for that. That is a principle that you have learned long ago, and, are, and you are using that for God's glory. And why is that? Because God is really doing a work in you. Now we come up to verse 3. And, and uh, the answer that Jesus is going to give is that uh, no one, really, no one has sinned here. That's not the issue. It's not who has sinned here. It's not the issue. Look at verse 3 with me. And uh, it says, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned. That's not the issue. Or his parents. But that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Brian, you hit right on it. This is the main teaching in these first five verses. Why is there evil in the world? Why doesn't God just take it away? Because he's doing a work. He is doing a work in every single one of us. And he will do that work until we are completed in glory. All to his praise. So, Jesus says it's neither. It's not that the, the young man had sinned. It's not that the parents had sinned. But only that the works of God might be displayed. God is at work in you. God is at work in our lives. This touches a, on a fourth issue, which is the problem of evil, also known as the doctrine of theodicy. If you've not heard that word before, write that down. <clears throat> the doctrine of theodicy. I've not thought about this for quite some time. It's spelled T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. This is where we get our, or people get their view, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? The Greek philosopher Epicurus surmise that if God is willing to prevent evil but is unable to do so because evil still exists, we still see evil in the world, but unable to do so, then God is not all powerful. That's a statement about God. God is weak. He can't be a true God. He went on to say, if God is able to prevent evil, in other words, he is all-powerful, and he's able to prevent evil, but doesn't, then God is unloving. He's not a God of love. So the problem of evil deals with God, the, these two questions about God. God can't be all-powerful. God can't be all-loving, because he has not eradicated evil in the world. The There are three avenues by which humanity experiences different levels of evil. The first one, the first avenue is by our own wrongdoing. We have all sinned and fall short. It does something in our when we will suffer the consequences of the things that we have done. And those consequences are unpleasant. We don't like going through it. But there's other types of evil. 
uh, disasters in the world, if you will. We would call them evil because it destroys people's lives. They're natural uh, events that occur, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes, or whatever the case might be. But there's also things that just happen in life. Life is dangerous <laughs> in and of itself. It's dangerous. You get into your car. Hopefully you get from point A to point B. But something might happen along the way. Hopefully you don't lose your life in it. Though many have. I remember when I was uh, driving down the road. It was a really rainy day. And I was in my side of mirror just to make sure uh, it was set in the center of the road. So I could you know, see what was going on behind me. I looked in front of me. The guy made a quick stop. And I didn't. And we have seen so often where saints often suffer horrific things that are outside of their control. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's uh, family disasters, family uh, situations that have occurred, dysfunction in the family. But things that are outside of our control. And then we see the wicked prosper and no apparent consequences. Ever think about that? Ever get upset about that? How the wicked seem to do so well? And uh, the psalmist talks about that in Psalm 73. This is a good passage to look at. Look with me at Psalm 73, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Psalm 73, verses 1 through 11. Look what the psalmist says here. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but... But as for me, he's struggling. The psalmist is struggling here. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. What caused him to stumble in his faith, in his walk with God? He says, my, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. He's looking around him. He sees individuals that are arrogant, they live their lives not according to God, but according to their own ways. And they're doing just fine. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pains until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken. Uh, like the rest of mankind. In other words, they're not experiencing the consequences of the evil that they are producing in life. Why? Why, God? Therefore, pride is their necklace. Their pride. They're prideful about the way they live their life. things and they're living well what's preventing me from doing the same logical question and they say how can God know how does God know what's going on in this world if he doesn't do anything about it is there knowledge in the most part does he not understand what we're going through in this life he does he does he's working all things together for good to those who love God. So we see the suffering that's going on, these different areas in which there can be suffering, the different areas of, of evil and the, the negative effects that it has. How are God's works displayed through you? Look back at verse 3. 
Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now look at verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me. What we are seeing here is that God is going to display his grace and his mercy in other people's lives through us. Through us. How does he do that? How, does, how is God working in, in all the things that we go and we struggle through in life? How is God working through us? Three things here. First, suffering <coughs> equips you to help others who are experiencing the same type of suffering you have already gone through. You experience certain suffering so that you can help others who are going through a time of similar type of suffering in their lives. Look with me at 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want to read verses 3 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies, there, there he is, he's the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. See, as God comforts us in our time of affliction, we can comfort others in theirs. God uses us in that process. Verse 5, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If I am being afflicted, if I'm going through something right now in my life, it's for somebody else's benefit down the road when they are going through it. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. So we go through suffering for a reason. God allows that because he's doing a great work through that by his grace and mercy. We go through trials of life that strengthen us in our resolve, in our perseverance, and in our faith. That is why we hear, you know, with the, uh, with the body armor, the spiritual body armor that God gives us in a, in a, that's spoken of in Ephesians chapter 6.16, we talk, he talks about the shield of faith against the wicked one. There is evil out there, but he has given to us the shield of faith in Christ that we can go through it, knowing that he is with us. And in 2 Thessalonians 1.4, it says, we boast about you. This is Paul boasting about the people, the believers in Thessalonica. Why? Regarding your steadfast faith in all your persecutions and afflictions, that you are enduring. God is going to bring them through it. But also suffering corrects. The suffering that we go through because oftentimes of our own wrongful decisions and, and sinful actions, suffering corrects our wrongful, sinful actions. It sets us back on track to obedience because we recognize from the consequences, the cause and effect, of what we have chosen to do, we recognize that as wrong, and it draws us back to God. Sometimes he has to um, spank us a little bit. Sometimes he has to correct us, doesn't he? And that's never fun when God corrects us, but it's because he loves us. I want to read to you in Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, no, actually, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have you turn there. I'm just going to read it to you. Listen to what it says, but write this down. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor test his correction, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. 
God is correcting us because we're going to. Just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So we see here in verse 4 that he is personalizing, go back to our test, that he personalizes what God is doing and he uses us in the <coughs> process. He says, we must do the works of him who sent me. This goes back to how we can uh, help alleviate the, the, the struggles, um, the, the, uh, the times of despair that people are going through. God uses us in that process. And look at what Jesus says here there. He says, oh, we do this. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. What does that mean, while it is day? It means while we are alive in this world. The moment that God got a hold of our heart and the light of Jesus Christ came into our life, from that moment we begin to enter in the work of what God is doing through us in helping others in their time of need and despair. It is God that is doing that work. And then it says, nighttime is coming when no one can work. Jesus is referring to himself here, but he's also speaking to us as well. Jesus knew that his time on earth, when it was day, would not be long. He was going to be going to the cross. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be dead and buried, ascended into heaven, and is now with the Heavenly Father. He's at the right hand of the Father. But you know what? God is still working. Because look at what it says there in verse 5. Look at verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. But he has given us a gift, which is in himself within us through the Holy Spirit. God Fullness of God is within us. Life, even though he is at the right hand of God, God the Father, the light is still in the world because we now are the light. God working through us to help people in time of need. Why does God allow evil to continue in this life? Because it is the work that he is doing through us for his by his grace and by his mercy. That is the whole purpose. So this is, this is how you can begin to, and you can take them to this passage and show them this, and focus on that primary verse, which is in verse 3, uh, so that the works of God might be displayed. God is displaying his work in you. In conclusion, the right perspective about evil in the world is that it's not that God is weak, it's not that he is loving, but that he is doing a glorious work in his life through you. For those who love God, all things work together for good. We know that they're going to work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And that's in Romans 8.28. So here's how I want you to remember this short passage. The truth is best remembered by this saying. In regard to the suffering, in regard to the evil that you might experience in this life, nothing happens to you. It happens for you. Nothing happens to you. It happens for you. And that is because God is going to use that his power and strength through you and, uh, and in helping others as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you praise and thanks for the work that you are doing in our life. We are not alone in this. We are not alone in our suffering and we are not
they see, and your ears for they hear. For many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, and did not see it. And to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Blessed are all who belong to Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in the strength of the Lord.